Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the second edition of the webinar Metal Snows and thank you very much for, for joining us. In the next hour, our focus will be on orchards and vegetable fields and best practices on how to mitigate the effects of frost and water stress. The fruit and vegetable sector is particularly affected by frost and the global warming, the risk of frost damage in the growing season may increase. Well, we cannot control the weather, of course, but we can monitor it and adjust the operation accordingly, accordingly, and that is what we will try to do today. Share actionable information for better risk management. I'm happy to present the host of the webinar, whom many of you already know from his podcast, United We Act, Derek Brazda. Derek, the microphone, the microphone is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Neja. Thank you, everybody, for being here uh, to this uh, second Meadows You Knows production of the, of the year. Um, <clears throat> I'll get it started here. I want to introduce our two speakers and give you a little background information on who they are and what they do and, and what we're going to talk about. But before I do, uh, just a, a quick reminder on some housekeeping items. Um, just like the first webinar, there will be a question and answer portion uh, at the end for our guests to answer any of your questions throughout the presentation. So if you have questions while we're going, uh, please just write them in the chat uh, at the side and we'll keep track of them. And if they don't get answered through the duration of the presentation, then uh, we will circle back and, and have a, a complete Q&A at the end. Uh, another thing, just I'd like to remind everybody to keep your microphones on mute throughout the duration, and uh, we'll make sure to, to, like I said, any questions that we have, we'll, we'll get through at the end. So up first, we have Sab Sabrina dreisebner Lanz from Yuanum Research. Sabrina is a researcher with LIFE, an Institute of Climate, Energy, and Society which is one of the leading research institutes in the world for key issues relating to climate change, climate risks, and the transformation research towards a climate neutral society. Sabrina has a degree in enology as well as a master's degree in agricultural science. Today, she's gonna to visit with us a little bit about the risks we face each year from the different kinds of damage that frost can do to our crops, uh, particularly fruit crops today, uh, and some ways to mitigate that risk. Also joining us is David Watoff of Meadows UK. Uh, David has been on the Pestle Instruments team for a little over two years now and is the Managing Director of the United Kingdom subsidiary Meadows UK. Uh, with 25 years of agricultural experience, 10 of which uh, he's focused on uh, precision agriculture, David has a degree in agriculture as well as a master's degree in soil sciences and is a certified agronomist and farm advisor. Uh, David's going to tell us a little bit about what we offer in the Meadows Toolbox for growers that need full visibility from the potential of frost risk, whether that's uh, an early warning sign or a measure of how bad the potential uh, damage could be for specific weather-related events. So, uh, Sabrina, David, uh, thank you so much for being here today. How are, how are things going with you? Yeah, well, hello. Hello. Welcome to everybody from the UK. Um, we're all well here. Thank you. Hello from Austria too. Um, at the moment we have a very sunny and warm weather, so we are already starting to be concerned about coming upcoming um, spring frost season um, and already thinking about butt break in grape points and yes, already having some concerns on that. Yeah, it seems, I mean, even globally, I, I'm, I'm here, I'm based out of the United States and, and we had a, a, a pretty significant frost event here last week or a pretty significant just cold snap everywhere. Uh, and a lot of people that are not used to getting that kind of weather. So it's uh, definitely a, a front and center issue for us to start talking about. So um, Chris, uh, Sabrina, I'm going to start things off with you. Uh, before we get going, uh, tell me a little bit about yourself. Uh, tell me about some of the research that you do. Um, yeah, I'll let you kind of just kick it off. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very happy to be uh, with you all today. And maybe you can start a presentation so that we just have the slides. Yep, it is. As Derek already mentioned, I'm working as a scientist at Yonium Research in Austria. And we are focused on the, the theme of climate change from very different um, points of view. And my, um, my working area is agriculture. And besides uh, my work as a scientist, I also work as consultant for 
organic viticulture at the Association of Organic Fruit uh, of Organic Farmers in Austria. So I am always having these two perspectives on the things um, from the scientist and also from the consultant um, point of view. On this um, slide, you can see um, where I am located, the green circle. This is the point which uh, refers to my um, position, actually. And this is the um, uh, overview of the um, AP Agri focus group um, frost protection, um, which I was a part of it. And I want now to go in, the, in, in this um, topic with the first slide on the frost damages. Just to give you some um, intro introduction how um, things are in Austria. Here you can see the frost damages in Styria on apple and wine production. And you see the um, very heavy frost events on 2016 and 2017. And these were also the starting point for a research project, project on behalf of the Styrian government that we were having at Joanneum. This project called Master Plan Klima Risiko Management Landwirtschaft focused on spring frost, droughts and heavy rainfalls in Styria. And we were um, just looking at all these um, climate risks, not only um, frost, but that was the main um, topic of it. Yeah, absolutely. It's yeah, I mean, it's staggering to look at some of these numbers and how much how much the the economic damage can be from, you know, from frost events. And, you know, as we, we kind of move forward, um, I've been fortunate enough to look through some of your research here over the past few days as we're as we're getting prepared. And you do a great job, uh, in my opinion, of breaking things down into into a simple process. So um, <clears throat> what I was wondering if, you know, to start this off, if you could just walk us through uh, what are the what are the seven steps of successful frost pre uh, protection or prevention? Yes, thank you. Um, as Derek said, um, I tried to sum it up for this evening um, on the relevant aspects in on seven points for seven steps. And if you can give now the slides again. Are the are the slides not are the slides not showing or <laughs> not not yet. <laughs> And maybe um, again to the, to the damages 2016 and 2017. Um, what you saw before, this were in, in euro um, damage, but um, to give you uh, some relation, um, for Syria in 2016, this um, refers to a total loss about in fruit production. For wine production, it was not that bad, um, but it was a really heavy um, frost event. 2017, then um, viticulture was not so. Um, hardly hit, but fruit production again. And also in 2020, we had uh, very, very severe uh, frost events, um, which hit um, especially the fruit producers. So the slides are not yet showing, Derek. Um. Derek, somebody else had shared their screen, which cut out the... Uh, ah. So Yes, <laughs> here we go. So the first point um, is the question, what kind of frost is expected? As some of or all of you know, um, we have um, several types of frost. Um, we can distinguish two kinds, radiation and wind frost, um, but there are also mixed um, events. So this is also possible. And for the radiation frost, um, the situation is often that the, that the um, sky is completely clear and it's getting um, a calm weather, no wind at all. And then in the night we have this um, typical inversion, um, which is in Styria very often, also in summer. So we have uh, inversion is, is for us a very uh, common um, weather situation. And then in this situation, the higher um, sites are warmer, so less um, frost risk on the higher sites and in the um, but in the um, lower sit sites, there is a, the temperature drops um, lower. And so the other situation is the wind frost, as already in the name. Um, this is a situation where there are cold winds 
and in this situation you don't have any inversion and then um, the site is not so um, important. So we have often the problem that uh, on wind frost situations, um, the better sites, the, the best um, sites are most affected because they um, just uh, are directly in this wind, um, uh, in this wind um, situation. So um, the, the point of the radiation or wind frost is that uh, depending on what kind of frost um, is upcoming, um, we need other reactions regarding um, the frost protection method. So this is very important. The second point is know your sites. Um, we have general um, sites which are more prone to radiation or, or wind frost. Um, this, this, this can be a general um, thing on the sites, but it's also depending on the weather situation in the frost night. And also within the sites, there are differences to be expected and the lowest spots are the most endangered in the frost night. The timing of bloom and bud break is also influenced by local conditions. So we see, for example, that northern um, sites are a bit, a bit slower, that their um, bud break or bloom is starting lower uh, later, or also higher sites. In Styria, we have some high sites with um, apricots, and this is uh, of, uh, an advantage regarding spring frost because they start blooming later on. Ideally, we should um, select the sites and match the sites, crops and varieties and rootstocks um, so that we have not the most um, vulnerable crops on the, uh, most, um, on the most risky sites. But this is a long-term option, so we cannot change this from one day to the other. Um, but if we have new plantations, then it's definitely worth looking at this. We have um, for Syria implemented a frost risk model. This is the um, lower picture you can see there. And uh, we have tried here, uh, implemented here uh, a modeling approach just to have a better and objective um, approach to, to estimate the frost risk because this is not so easy. Um, for Syria, it's not easy because we have a very um, high impact of the topography um, in general. Next slide. The third point is the short-term and medium-term weather forecast. Um, for Styria, it's, this is a very difficult point because the topography, as I mentioned before, is very tessellated. Um, so forecast is rather difficult. Um, in our project, we investigated the quality of frost forecast and saw differences between providers. In general, some frost situations are, very, are easier to pr um, predict um, for example, if there are, there is a stable inversion um, situation, and others are um, more tricky um, to predict. And a very important point for you um, on a farm level, it's not possible to to um, predict weather um, like this. So this is a, a general um, topic um, which can only be done by um, the, um, the corresponding um, providers. Also important. Um, what, what, on what um, information we need reliable data on the frost severity, how cold will it get, um, what um, kind of frost is expected, radiation or wind frost, and the localization of the frosts. Um, and also development of wind clouds or precipitation. This is very important. Afterwards, we talk about, for example, um, irrigation. And so um, wind is a very important factor um, if frost irrigation is possible or not. Precipitation, this was a, um, the, the upper picture shows uh, the situation in 2016. So here we had some snowfall, which was not predicted. Um, so everyone was very um, surprised, even the weather providers, um, about 20 centim centimeters of snow. And this was um, a very relevant um, effect because um, the fruit producers closed their, their hail nets to keep the warmth in under the nets and then um, they all crashed down because of the um, load of the snow. So this is a very important point um, also um, regarding precipitation. Next slide. 
The fourth point is the question how sensitive are the plants at the moment? Um, we have um, various factors which are influencing the vulnerability on the plant side. Um, it's the phenological stage and we have, um, we can observe for, for many years now that's due to climate warming, plants are developing earlier and cold waves are hitting plants in a vulnerable, vulnerable stage. Um, so this is a very important point, um, but that there are also other influences, uh, for example, nutrition status, um, especially nitrogen and potassium are important for the sensibility, sensitivity of the plants and also the plant health and maturity of the cane example here shown on viticulture uh, with canes which are not um, of a good quality of um, maturity of the canes. And then also the crop variety and has an has a important effect on the sensitivity but also on the recovery. So we have here two effects. Um, first, how hard is the plant hidden when the, uh, the temperature drops, but also how good can, can uh, the plant recover. And for example, um, with a very important variety, which is known over the whole world, Sauvignon Blanc, we saw that in Styria, um, we have the very uh, nice advantage that Sauvignon Blanc um, starts spot break a bit later than other varieties, um, is less sensitive in case of temperature drops and at last also it recovers rather um, good. So here we have a variety which um, is um, regarding spring frost less problematic than other varieties. And also the actual state of the plants, for example, if um, the tissue is wet, um, can play an important role. We have saw, saw this in 2017. Um, there, the, there was the relative humidity of the um, air was very, very low um, in one frost night and we had temperatures um, dropping rather deep, but there was no um, damage on viticulture because everything was so dry. Next slide. Here you have some examples for the critical temperatures and we see um, on all um, varieties we have here um, that uh, we have a range between 10 percent of the buds or, or fruits are killed uh, until 90 percent is killed and we see that the range is wider um, when the plants are not developed so far and the, the further the development goes um, the smaller the, um, the range is um, so the, the um, sensitivity to frost is getting more and more um, uh, depointed. Next slide. Also for citrus, um, I have here the numbers. Um, citrus is general, generally rather very tender and temperatures of already one or a half degree below zero can already um, be lethal to the fruits. Next slide. A very important point um, is number five, be aware of the actual situation and the relevant data. So here um, we come to the weather data and the importance of real-time weather data, um, which can be gener generated on farm level. Um, and why is it important? Um, we need this real-time weather data for timing, steering, and also monitoring of fro frost protection measures. And here for these measurements, a high accuracy and short intervals are needed, but we don't need any available sensors which are um, possible. Um, on every spot. So we need, uh, for example, not a wind sensor on every spot. Um, it's more important to have several spots um, with temperature and humidity. And the data should be relevant to the problem we are addressing. So depending on the crop, um, the interesting measuring points may be rather low, lower than on the standard height of weather stations, which is about um, two meters normally, at least in, in Austria. And furthermore, the most critical spots should be observed. So the coldest, uh, which are most of the time also the lowest spot in the orchards or in the vi vineyards. And here, regarding sensors, a very important point is the wet bulb and dry bulb uh, temperature. Um, David will talk on this later on, um, but I can just um, 
uh, point this out that this this point is for this is for the um, for the actual situation a very important point, especially for frost irrigation. Next slide. Uh, maybe not as set can be if you have several measuring points, then you can um, just uh, uh, look at all your um, all your sites, or also the exchange um, with colleagues can be um, very helpful if you have colleagues um, nearby. Um, where temperature is normally dropping earlier. And then if you have a system of communication with those, then you um, already know, okay, um, the neighbor has already um, temperatures below zero, so I have to um, start with anything. So the next slide, point six, um, the, the, to choose the correct um, measure um, is depending on the effect and on the side effects um, regarding the type of frost. Um, we have to choose the right measure um, for and for permanent installations such as irrigation or wind machines. Um, it's sensible to um, look at the most probable frost type. For Syria, for example, it's radiation frost. Methods that work only in aver inversion situations, also radiation frost, um, like a wind machine, are only suitable when the most probable event is also radiation frost and also with a strong enough inversion because um, the wind machines work on mixing the air. And so if the temperature difference is not um, uh, strong enough normally, then it doesn't make any sense to install a wind machine. And beside the method itself um, that can be chosen, um, also the intensity of the measure can be adjusted for some measures, for example, for heating, um, it can be adjusted. Next slide. Also, um, the costs and resources are an important point to choose the suitable measure. And we have there um, high differences between capital costs, fixed costs, and running costs of different frost protection methods. Um, and here also, again, the risk for frost plays an important role regarding the cost effectiveness. effectiveness. For example, if an event um, is very rare, it doesn't make any sense to install methods with high capital costs. Furthermore, the economics of frost protection depends highly on the marginal return. Valuable crops can be protected more expensive. Some methods are also very labor consuming. So it's also important if we have uh, the corresponding, per corresponding manpower available. Otherwise, um, we have to choose other methods. We often have the problem of scarcity of water. Um, so this may impose a relevant limit to the implementation of frost irrigation. And also legal limitations um, can be a limiting factor or become uh, costly. In our research, we had a close look on env um, environmental impacts such as greenhouse gas emissions and on costs. Next slide. So here for the costs, um, we have made some calculations on, based on data in, in Austria, um, on Styria. And we can see here um, rather high differences between um, the different methods. And um, here it's very um, nice visibly the different cost categories, um, which are um, corresponding to, the, to each um, frost protection method. And an interesting point um, we found about the paraffin candles. So um, you see here um, two columns and you see here two different numbers. And that's because we found a relevant gap between the measured efficiency and manufacturer's information and so this is also um, reflected here in the economic aspect. Next slide. We also had a look at the greenhouse gases and calculated um, these emissions. And we see here a very high difference um, between the heating materials. Um, and we see also see that irrigation or wind machines um, are very um, good regarding greenhouse emissions. Next slide. Regarding particulate matter, um, it's a similar picture, um, but we see that all um, heating methods have some um, emission of particular matter, um, especially peat, which is uh, really very critical um, regarding this point. Um, and irrigation and wind machine, again, have very nice um, values. 
Overall, if we look at all the um, points uh, for the heating methods, um, we, we saw that the wood briquettes um, had the best um, results regarding costs and also regarding emissions. Next slide. Last but not least, the perfect timing um, of any action is crucial. Um, and at which temperature the measures should be started or can be stopped depends on the protection method and on the sensitivity of plants. As we saw before, plants can cope with lower temperatures in an earlier stage. So it might be feasible um, to decide according the phenological stage um, not to start um, any measures um, or to, and to, to keep uh, resources, for example, water. Regarding the method um, for the frost irrigation, the start um, has to be, for the start, um, the air humidity has to be um, considered. Uh, the drier it is, the higher the starting temperature. And this is due to the higher difference between wet and dry bulb temperature under this condition. An important factor is also the amount of water that is applied. Um, with lower water loads, um, the start has to be, has to, um, be earlier. Regarding heating methods, um, we have to think of the lag phase, phase. so it's, it um, takes some time until the heating effect starts. So, um, and this is not um, equal for each um, burning material. So um, we have to think of this um, lag phase also. Anyhow, all efforts can be in vain if weather conditions change unexpected or um, <laughs> the changes are not um, forecasted. Um, for example, if wind is coming up um, during an irrigation, a frost irrigation, um, then um, it's, you have only bad choices um, before. You can continue with a bad effect um, on adverse effects or you can stop it. And it's also um, not, not um, helping anyhow. So um, again, reliable weather data and forecast is crucial on a farm level, but also on a um, broader level, not on farm level. Well, thank you. That was that you know very in depth, and I think you know everybody can agree you know, and this is coming from you know my, myself here in the in the United States where we just saw a massive cold front, and I, I have to say one point you made when you showed that that slide of the um, uh, the the vineyard uh, that had you they weren't expecting any snow. It's almost mm -hmm. kind of comforting to know that that doesn't just happen here because I, I feel like that's a uh, a very common event when, when we have no idea. Like, I think it was just last weekend I woke up and there was six inches of snow that nobody was counting on that. So it's comforting to know that it happens all over the world. But one thing that, you know, as, as weather kind of gets more severe and whether that's, uh, you know, more severe on the hot side or more severe on the cold side, it's, this is definitely information that more people, you know, need access to, or, or, you know, the different types of frost and, and what are some things that we can do to prevent it. So as we kind of yes. keep up, oh, go ahead. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, as we as we kind of keep going, um, I know you've talked about you know these are the the seven steps for for kind of having your awareness of of frost damage, including you know what what type of frost are you at the most risk for. Um, I, I guess I would like to ask you to to kind of move into some more in field procedures, some use cases that you're seeing that growers can do to help mitigate the risk and, you know, some actual, actual cases of what, uh, what are these events and, and how are they, how do they work? Yes. Um, you can uh, give me the next slide. Oh, no, that's just the correct slide. Sorry. <laughs> uh, last, it takes a, a moment. Um, so I have picked um, up some examples. Uh, the first is the frost irrigation. I will only be very short on this because um, David will talk on that um, later. Um, in general, frost irrigation is a, a very safe and efficient method. Works until about 70 degrees below zero. Um, one problem is definitely that it's not applicable under windy conditions. So under wind frost, it's not uh, it's not applicable. Um, about three meters per second is the limit um, here, and it's not suitable for all crops. Crops we have some crops or some situations also regarding soils um, where the frost irrigation with these high water amounts um, are not feasible because of plant um, health. 
um, or also damages um, of branches and um, the saturation of soil with water. As I mentioned before, water availability can be a critical factor, um, although we have very high um, precipitation amounts during the year. Um, nevertheless, um, water can definitely be um, scarce. And so um, we also looked at the things we can do um, to, to manage this um, problem. And um, one point is the um, water saving by micro sprinklers. Um, this is here, there is the, the problem that we have not yet um, really practical um, implementation, at least in Austria not, um, because um, the steering is not um, so easy. Um, we have to start earlier, as I mentioned before, because of the lower amount of water. Uh, and also we have the technical problems with freezing um, of the small um, tubes and pipes um, on the sprinklers. Um, what is done often um, on our sides is the water recuperation um, because we have anyhow draining systems on slopes. Um, so here we have um, the chance to recycle water. Um, very important if there are several um, frost nights um, in a row, as we had it 20 um, in, in last year. Um, yes, so this is, um, these are the possible um, um, ways out of, of the water scarcity. Um, very important adverse effects um, can occur if there is wind, too much wind, um, if the timing is wrong, so starting too late or um, stopping too early, or, or cold day temperatures as we had it uh, last year in Syria. Um, here the temperatures were so cold on day time that the ice was not melting away. Um, and so farmers had to irrigate or nights and or day um, until um, temperature finally um, started to go up. Next slide. Uh, a nice example for me is the butt break delay on grape vines. Um, for this, um, plant oil is applied on butts um, and canes um, two times, approximately 30 days before butt break. So in Austria, we are about next week um, for this application. Um, due to the oil film, um, tissue res respiration is reduced and so the butt break is delayed. Um, but we saw a, a high variety um, between the delays. They range from zero to 14 days. Some reported even 21 day um, of delay. Um, but it's, it's, it's very um, depending on variety, year and on site. Um, so it's not so easy to um, to to time and to um, apply this um, application um, very um, accurate. And we also saw some phyto phytotoxic and yield effects. Um, and in general, the timing is a challenge, um, but the, ef um, the effect might not be sufficient. And so you have to um, do some additional frost protection um, measures. Um, but it's, in my opinion, it's a very smart method um, working also for radiation and wind frost, which is an important point because um, for wind frost, we don't have many um, possibilities um, to cope with. Next slide. Here's some um, selected results um, from Styria. We have um, on the left hand the percentage of buds in stage four. And we see here the effect of the treatment. Um, the black line is the control, which was not treated. And we also saw that the earlier um, treatments were more efficient, um, and, but a third um, treatment was not um, so much better. So we, we stick about with the two treatments, um, about 30, 35 days um, starting before butt break. And on the right hand, we see the percentage of each stage um, for the control and the two-time treated um, buds. And we see here a greater part of buds in an earlier and therefore less sensitive stage. For the effect of this method, it's not relevant um, the average stage um, of in the vineyard, but relevant is the buds um, that are in a less sensitive stage and are surviving um, the frost event. And as the grapevine can compensate very good, um, if we have half of the buds surviving, um, then we have already a very good um, success on frost protection. Next slide. For 
Wind, um, as I know, it's, it's in some regions, wind-grown regions, it's very usual to have um, wind, uh, wind machines um, in the, in the wind-growing region. The working principle is mixing the air and bringing warm air from higher air layers um, into the crops. Um, so it's also logical that this can only work if there are warmer um, air layers. Um, and so we definitely need an inversion um, situation and the inversion must be um, strong enough so that it works. Um, in, um, on our sides, we observed a maximum temperature rise of three degrees and this is definitely not enough for, very, um, for many of our frost events. Next slide. Um, for the heating, um, this can be applied if, the, if, uh, if frost irrigation is not suitable. Um, it's a rather expensive method. Um, so it's, um, it needs a lot of manpower also, and is therefore only justified for valuable crops with high return. But we have several crops where it's definitely a good option. Um, and only, also the only option um, somehow. And our trials showed that a convection plays an important role on slopes. So it's definitely um, a possibility to adjust uh, the distribution pattern on the sides um, regarding also the slopes. So you can um, less install less heaters in the upper parts and more heaters in the lower parts. And definitely has, it has an effect also on the upper parts um, of the slopes. And yes, the number of ovens and candles depends on the type of heaters. We have um, rather small heaters here, but there are also fruit growing regions or vine growing regions where um, bigger um, ovens um, are used. Next slide. Yes, some um, further aspects and research questions uh, which may um, apply to, to many um, countries um, is the, the, the topic of the financial coverage of crop losses and insurance. Then also there are some additional methods such as pruning strategies or underground sprinkling. And what would be an interesting point is also about break uh, delay for other crops or with other substances um, and delaying effects of rootstocks on bloom or bud break. But um, for our um, varieties and used rootstocks, we did not have found any rootstocks that are really delaying um, bud break or bloom until now. So um, thank you. Um, you can find more information on, this, on the site of the AP Agri Focus Group. This is also in English um, or information so anyone um, can understand this. Sabrina, <clears throat> thank you so much for going through that with us. And I just want to to give everybody a reminder. Uh, Sabrina will be here throughout the the duration of the of the rest of the show here. So as we transition again, if you have any questions about anything, uh, feel free to drop them in the drop them in the um, in the chat box, and we will get to them at the end. And I'm gonna <clears throat> get David's presentation pulled up here so that we can kind of transition over. David, are you still with us? Yes, I'm still here. David, so we got a lot of really good information from Sabrina about how to properly manage frost across the, a handful of different scenarios. So what I'd like to do is turn it over to you and give us some, uh, what, what do we offer in the Meadows uh, toolbox that allows people to, to properly manage this, whether it's uh, an early warning sign and understanding. Uh, I'll kind of turn it over to you and, and let you kind of to let you kind of go through your presentation here. So are, is everybody seeing the screen again? Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you, Derek. So uh, good evening, everybody. Again, um, it's, it, it's great, great to be here. Um, it's uh, certainly um, uh, c certainly in the UK, you know, just like Derek had, we, we had some, uh, some cold weather just just recently. Um, and, and which was a bit of a surprise, not quite as bad, but it, it, it uh, made it made it challenging for a few days. But now it, it's warmed up, and today has been sort of 12 or 13 degrees, if not more, um, and, and things have started to grow. So of course, if you have it cold and then warm, things start to grow quickly. We need to keep an eye on the on on how quickly things start to develop. 
Um, and this is just a great opportunity to, to highlight um, the technology within, within Metos, which we've got to, to help make um, decisions better. So if we go to the first slide, Derek, please. For the last 35 years, uh, Metos has been uh, uh, one of the leading technologies for frost monitoring um, across the world. And the product uh, which we uh, make best use of is, is our Echo D3 frost here. Um, but the key element really is the, uh, the, the small sensor unit where the little water bottle is and the, and, the, and the wet and dry unit. So combined as a unit, it's very easy to deploy. It um, has its own uh, solar panel and internal battery. Uh, there's lots of connection options. So we have a cellular option and, and uh, 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 MBIOT options, so depending on, on, on what your, your connectivity is. The weather data is transmitted in real time from the field. This is a real bonus. It'll be straight to your pocket, or if you've got, uh, if you haven't, um, or direct to your your um, uh, web portal. But of course, the great thing is that data can be very easily shared, so it, it, it makes makes full use. You've got, the key thing about the wet and dry bulb sensor is ultimately is the accuracy and the sensitivity for a frost alarm. So you'll notice that we have an unshielded uh, sensor, and the reason for this is it, it better models the, the, plant's, uh, the plant temperature, but also the, the plant tissues as well. And just using the, the example on the right-hand side, the, the sort of the blue bars, this is sort of showing you the sort of the net radiation um, of, 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 of daytime and nighttime. So in the daytime, you're getting a positive uh, a radiation from uh, from from the sun, um, and also a little bit reflected back from from the ground. But at night time, clearly, you're not getting that, and so you're getting a uh, you're getting a higher value of negative. Uh, more energy is radiation energy is is, is lost, and having a, a sensor which is sensitive to that is really important. So this is why we need to use a, a free wet bulb temperature sensor because it better represents the temperature within the plant tissue. Um, during the frost conditions and thus making the timeliness of switching the irrigation on and off and uh, Sabrina mentioned this in her slides and I'll come back to it shortly when it when the plant develops and gets more 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 mature the 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 the, the gap the, between the the uh, um, switching on and switching off narrows so much you need to have a really accurate uh, response so this is why our sensor is 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 ideal for this Next slide, please, Derek. Also, sticking it in the right place is, is also a, a key factor. Um, I've got some customers in the UK with some uh, vineyards, and, and what I've recommended them to do is, is just place um, some min-max temperature sensors uh, around the vineyard to get an idea of where the lowest and the coldest point is. And this allows you to best deploy the, the, the system. And in terms of deployment, really really easy um, just comes on a pole you stick the pole in the ground put the uh, cellular switch the cellular on and and and, and you're away so um, identifying that the the site is key um, and deployment is really easy next slide we've mentioned before that there's some different frost protection methods um, we're going to talk in more detail about the the um, uh, active method of, of the, the irrigation but clearly there's some frost buster equipment, there's, there's, there's bougies, there's covering up, and of course those who, who, who've got a helicopter can make full use of that. But ultimately, the, the technology is the same. Understanding when to make a good decision is what Metos is all about. So if we move, the, move on again. So if we're looking at a sprinkler system in more detail, I suppose it would be very easy to think that a, um, it's very counterintuitive to put water on to protect your buds, but the key element which makes it a, a practical solution is the uh, um, is the, uh, the the release of latent heat um, when you're actually putting the water on, and so this is this is it's this latent heat which stops the temperature of the buds and um, getting any lower. So um, and 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 that is that is the sort of the key science behind it. So you need to be aware that sprinklers can cause good um, can cause more harm than good, and you need to apply enough water to maintain this latent heat release. 
Spring should be started before the wet temperature dropped below zero degrees C and set the minimum threshold of wet temperature at plus half degree or plus one. So you've got time to, to, to make a decision and, 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 and activate the sprinklers. And when water droplets strike a flower, bud or a small fruit, the water will freeze and it's releasing this latent heat, which will temporarily raise the plant temperature. And the, the, the pictures below show the temperature which the plant is naturally um, able to uh, withstand, uh, um, withstand a, a frost. But it's, it's being aware of, as the plant develops, that you need to change the, the, uh, the warning level within the, within the system. So it's no good setting it early season at minus two and then wondering why in two or three weeks time that you've, you've got a frost issue um, when, when the, the plant has moved on and it's more sensitive at a, at a, at a, at a warmer temperature. Next slide. So when to turn it off? Again, when the wet bulb is above the critical temperature, and we'll look at those in more detail in a moment. All sprinklers should be operating before the wet temperature dro drops below the critical uh, temperature. And the, the, the key thing here is also to consider, make sure pro that all the sprinklers are functional. Um, Sabrina mentioned it, if you've got a micro system, make sure that the, 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 the pipes are well serviced and the system is going to fun function when you need it. And it's not going to be in a state of disrepair earlier. In terms of turning off, when the sun is shining on the crop and the wet bulb temperature upwind is higher than the critical temperature. In practice, wait until uh, zero degrees, but if it's too windy or if the dew point is low, don't just turn off. You've got to wait in at least one degree C because it's really important to maintain this latent heat exchange. And ideally, you want the water running off the icicles. You don't want the icicles. The icicles need to be as clear as glass. They don't need to be um, an opaque because that that will um, that will be an issue. That was when the crop is will be damaged. Next slide, please. So when the water is applied, the temperature falls and rises, which we've discussed. So when the sprinkler was first started, the wet the plant temperature might drop to the wet bulb temperature. So don't be alarmed because you've started this above your critical point. So you're 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 in a good position. The the temperature then increases as the water freezes because of this latent heat release. However, again, as Sabrina mentioned, if the dew point is, is temperature is low and the wet bulb is much lower than the air temperature, damage can occur is if, is if insufficient water is applied. So having a good supply of water is really key and important. So in terms of looking at um, beware of this low dew point, I mean, it, it's a point we've, we've highlighted here Temperatures will drop lower when the air is dry, so keeping an eye on the humidity is key. And turning on sprinklers may initially bring the surface temperatures of the vines below the freezing point due to the evaporative of cooling. So what to do, the drier the air, the sooner you must turn on the sprinklers. So if you're in a situation where you've got low humidity and you can begin to see that in a low dew point, then you really need to think about activating the sprinklers sooner um, than, than, than your, 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 your best practice. Next uh, slide, please, Derek. Um, again, looking at the w amount of water required, a minimum of three mil millimeters an hour is required to provide protection as low as minus three. So you need a good, healthy supply of water. Another half a millimeter an hour is required for every additional degree below this. So again, that, that begins to kick in. Don't, it's not suitable in a, in, in a windy frost, so that's not, um, uh, not, not, not ideal. And then also you need to pay more attention to, the, to, to more susceptible varieties. So there's just some considerations, practical considerations there. But one of the exciting things about the METOS system, we've got a nested approach to technology, which means we can add more, more sensors and more, more uh, information to help you understand and manage your, your system. And one of the additional sensors which we can add is a pipe pressure sensor. What this allows you to do, and you can see the charts here. So the top chart is the orange is the, the dry bulb temperature and the, and the uh, purple is the uh, uh, wet bulb temperature. 
and the red underneath is the tu is the is the uh, water pressure signature from the irrigation pipe. So you can see here clearly where the temperature has dropped below freezing that the pipe uh, became pressurized and became activated. But there was a period there between the 29th and the 30th of March where that gray arrow is, where the, the, there was no pressure in the line. And this very clearly indicates that, that there was no protection at that period. And there was a, a significant a, a service would, would, would be required. It's also worth noting, noting the jagged nature of the red line, which is showing how the, 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 the system's not really um, uh, giving you sort of a bang bang. It's not really giving you pressure on, pressure off. It, it, it's struggling. So if we go to the next slide, you can see what would happen when we um, improve the situation. So you can see um, down at the bottom where we had a, a, a service, and between the 2nd and the 3rd of April, where you could see a consistent pressure of, of water pressure in the line at, at the points of, 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 of applying the water. So this nested approach to technology really is very simple to implement. It shows real-time uh, real benefits in terms of what, what was the need to deliver, what was the need to, to uh, um, um, in terms of, of switching the sensors on, switching the sprinklers on, but, but what was the timing required to do that? Next slide, please, Derek. I, I guess I'd just like to comment. It's also a peace of mind that, you know, you can just make sure that, the, uh, use this to make sure that your irrigation system is working properly, right? Where if you do, you'd mentioned with the, with the spikes, but if you, if you think it should be on, it should be at, at one level, uh, it, it kind of can give you a sense of urgency if you've got to get back out there if you're in the middle of one of these frost events and, and you see you're having some problems with your pressure switch. Yeah, completely. And and this data is also shown on your app. So if you're busy in the fields doing other things and you and 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 this might be at a, at a, at a remote site and you just just take a look, you know, it, it just might change your day because it's make it helping you make a better decision. So um, you know, it's it, it's a great approach. So this is really just a nice picture, but uh, what it really shows is is two things. One is it shows you um, on the left, you can see how clear the icicles are. And, and this is really an indicator of what you're looking for. You're looking for the water to be running down the face of the ice, icicle to, to maintain that, that latent heat exchange, that process of maintaining a, 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 a temperature. Also on the right hand side, you can also see that you've got the, 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 the station there. It's slightly obscured, but there's a station sort of in the middle view, but also there's a, some, a, a lower sensor. So also understanding where, um, how best to deploy the, 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 the technology at your most sensitive area. So if you're concerned about that, you know, you've got your, a fruiting wire at, um, lower down, you, things you've got some uh, five meters of cable between the, the station and the, the sensor, you can, you can deploy the technology um, uh, to, to, ma to make an accurate, an, an accurate interpretation. Next slide. This is just an interesting rule of thumb. Um, and, and it's just something uh, to help you uh, just, 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 just to take points on. The, the minimum temperature on a given morning will approach the, the, the temperature taken from the prior evening. So if you can just put your cursor on, that blue, on the light blue line above the uh, 3rd of April, about 5 o'clock, um, Derek, just up a little bit, up a little bit. You can see there where that dew point line is beginning to um, uh, be. And then when the dew point and the, the temperature collide, that's giving you an indication. So on the, on the third or the fifth, on the Saturday, you can see that that temperature is moving across. And what's nice about this, just as a rule of thumb, is the night before when you're just thinking, oh, there's going to be a frost, it's going to give you an indication of just how cold that's going to be. And so that might help you just think about um, uh, um, when you want to set your, your, the settings on, the, on your Meta sensor, thinking, well, okay, it's going to be sort of minus two. I know the plant's moved on a little bit. It might just make you, give you an opportunity just seven or eight hours ahead of a problem to, to make an adjustment. Next slide. So here we've got uh, the critical temperatures. Um, we're looking at the critical temperatures of, um, of, of the, uh, of, of, for the frost protection. Um, we're looking at uh, apples, apricots, cherries all the way through. Um, and you can see, if we're just looking at the apples for now, 
Um, if we're looking at the 10% kill, there's T10 up to T90, the 90% kill, you can see there's a, a, a six degree range. But as the plant develops, that range drop significantly and so you know if you look at full pink and first bloom you've got nearly just one degree difference between a, a, a t10 and a t90 um, uh, result and it's at these points when having the right sensor placed in the right position make all the difference because you've got to consider you've got to consider um the 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 the, the sensitivity between a 10 percent and a 90 percent kill and using the right sensor at the right place will will alleviate that will alleviate that consid considerably. And you can see for your own crops around the world, you can see those uh, the, 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 those those values. If we can move on, again for viticulture, um, uh, the, the plant itself, the wood the wood of the plant is is is, is fairly robust and, and can cope with with a good lot, or albeit new growth is 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 quite sensitive. But the grapes themselves and the buds and, and the leaves are peculiarly sensitive and, and you know, the 10% kill kicks in certainly around the minus two figure, um, and, and the, but the 90% kill, if you look at the third and fourth leaf, you've got less than one degree difference between a 10% and a 90% kill. So getting, getting the, the, the right sensor at the right time is, is key for that. And then we've got uh, for you guys with the, uh, with the fruit crop, Again, you've got a, a, a very close range um, of, of um, a, a very close range of, of, of temperatures again. So this is my sort of how do I do it slide. You know, we've, we've spoken a lot about the, uh, the, the technology, having the right sensor, putting it in the right place. But Phil Climate is, is the interface, is the piece of technology, is the software which allows you to, to, to integrate it. It's, it's supremely easy to operate. And if you uh, want to change your frost warnings and get an SMS warning, you just go to the, the station settings and you scroll down to the station SMS warnings. And this will allow you to put your phone number and a name into the, into the checkbox. You have to uh, prefix it with your international dialing code. But once you've done that and clicked add, then you can put yourself and, and your colleagues and members of staff um, um, on there to, to receive a warning. Once that's done, you can then set really easily the trigger value. So all of the station sensors are, are displayed, and this is just one of the, 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 with a dry bulb and a wet bulb. And you can then move across and put your minimum and maximum se uh, uh, sensor, sorry, minimum and maximum temperature into the sensor. So I've just set this as a temperature of two degrees, but you could very easily set that at, at, at one degree or, or whatever you wanted. If this was quite a remote site, can I just go back, Derek? Sorry. If it was just quite a remote site, um, and you wanted a little bit more time to get to get to the site to 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 uh, implement a change, you could go three comma two, and you'll get a text at three degrees, and you'd also get a text at two degrees. So it allows a, a, a little bit of a, a a heads up opportunity. So the final slide. So here's just a bit of a checklist. It sort of runs through with, with, what we've, with what I've been talking about. We need to have the correct choice of sensor. We need to get the right piece of kit to do the right job. We need to make sure the, the station's in the right place, but also we need to make sure that the sensor is placed on the fruiting wire or, or, or ne next to the most sensitive buds. For irrigation, you need to ensure there's an adequate water supply. If, you've got, if you're putting three millimeters on per hectare, for, sorry, three millimeters, three millimeters on an hour, um, then you, you, you know, it's, it's no good that that water will, will uh, runs dry. A water pressure sensor as part of this nested approach is, is, is a really smart move. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a small additional investment, but it really it will give you, give you some peace of mind about the, the, the operation of the equipment and the delivery. Regular sprinkler maintenance is key. Make sure d during the day that, that, that the stuff's going to work when you want it at night. And you can set the SMS warnings according to growth stage um, and change that as, 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 the plant, as the plant develops. So that's where I want to sort of end off, Derek. So thank you, everybody, for your attention. I, I think we've covered a lot of ground off, and, and I, I think we've sort of come to a good, a, a, a good stopping place. So 
Um, I, I haven't sort of checked the questions, but I, I, over to you, Derek. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, David. Um, basically, what I want to do now is open up the floor. Neja, I'll bring you back up if, if you've been kind of tracking if there are any questions that we've had. I know we covered a lot of information there. Uh, thank you, Derek. Uh, yeah, we got uh, three questions. Two were for Sabrina, and she already answered them both in the chat box. Oh, uh, yeah, and we got two questions uh, now for David. Um, the first one is um, the following. If we use heating methods for frost protection, is it okay to monitor dry bulb temperature, or we also need to monitor wet bulb temperature? So I would uh, I, I would say that you need to uh, monitor the, the, the you know the, the wet bulb as well simply because it's going to be much more sensitive to give you that early warning of the, of, of the frost. So the the, the combined um, sensor fits to an Echo D3 or to an IMT station, and and I would I would uh, um, monitor the wet bulb for for the frost. Thank you. Um, how does SMS works? Uh, when is it sent and is it sent from the cloud or unit? Yeah, so this is a key point um, and uh, what's really important is this, this, the, uh, uh, the SMS is sent from the station um, and, not, and not from the cloud. And so what this allows you to do is, is, um, uh, is have the confidence that the, 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 the conditions, you're getting alerted from the conditions in the field not from uh, uh, 15 minutes later or half an hour later if there was a delay in communication. So uh, it, it's, it's a real strong point of the Metos equipment um, and, and it's, it's, it's a, a, a very important point. And I think it's also important to note that, that regardless of what station you have, if it's, uh, if it's one of these that we're looking at or if it's a, a full-blown weather station or, or whatever, whatever the metrics, whatever sensors were, are attached to that station, we have that ability to send automated alerts uh, across all product lines. So um, if you're, you're wanting to have that, the confidence and that you're getting alerted when things are happening as they're happening, um, I would suggest if you have any questions about any of these units, reach out to you know your your metal uh, distributor in your area. Reach out to your pestle employee in your area to to help put together a package that that works for your operation because everybody's operation is going to be different uh, depending on where you are, what your goals are, and what your capabilities of uh, of management are. So, uh, with that, I think we've covered everything that we wanted to. Neja, I want to thank everybody for being here. Thank you, David. Thank you, Sabrina, for your time today. Um, I'll turn it back to you, Neja. Uh, yeah, I just uh, saw that we got actually two more questions. Oh, uh, I'm not sure excellent. if Sabrina is already um, answering them. Uh -huh, yeah, she's uh, nodding yes. Uh, <laughs> so you will get the, those two questions in the um, in the chat box. Uh, and if anybody has any more Sorry, questions... Sorry, Neja, um, only the first. Uh, the second is for um, David. Maybe he oh. can answer this and I will t type the first question. Okay. Oh, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So, David, back to you. Can we start irrigation system with a station uh, with automatic? Yes. So, so basically, there's, there's there's two ways of doing doing it. So it's not directly from the the the, 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 the field climate, but basically we have a a, a tie up with irrigation um, uh, uh, manufacturer uh, with manufacturers of irrigation equipment where the data from the station will go into uh, their equipment and that and then is, it's that which will trigger the automatic control. So we've got a number of manufacturers who have got what we call the API, the access to our, to our information, and, 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 and that, will, um, that, that will allow you to, to do that. In terms of, of um, I can see there's another question, in t we've also got a, 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 another opportunity with, uh, with a, a product which is called Sverag, um, where we're fully integrated. This allows us to use, I'm just wondering if I've got a small unit here. We've got this small uh, solar unit here, uh, which is can be connected to a, a, a solenoid and also a, a um, flow meter. And then this, this also can be used to uh, Automate the the irrigation process. So there are a number of there are a number of solutions which we work in tandem with, um, and 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 making an effective solution. 
Where do I buy okay. your stuff in Ontario? Eric? Say, say, so, say that again. Where do you buy your machinery in Ontario, Canada? Um, uh, Guy, if you're around. Yeah, you'd Guy, buy it. Hi, yeah, you'd buy it from Metos Canada. So, um, as you can provide the contact uh, for that, or you just look up Netto's Canada up Google on the. You. Pardon me? Do the Google? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I also wrote an uh, email from Guy Ash. You can con contact him directly, and yeah, he will send you the information that you need. Google Metals Canada, yeah. That will also give you the information that you're looking for. Um, we are already past the time. So again, if anybody has any questions, you can always write to uh, marketing uh, at metals.at. Um, this is all for today. Uh, I really want to thank you for taking your time and staying with us till the end. And uh, I really hope that we will see you again next month, uh, last Wednesday of the month in, um, in March, when we will be discussing the optimization of operations with IoT related to row crops. Uh, we will look into work planning, nutrition, seeding, planting, field preparation, work planning, fertility, spraying preparation for the season. Uh, until then, stay healthy. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, where you can, you, where you will be posted on the latest news developments around methods. Or, as said, you can always contact us uh, at marketing uh, at methods.it, and we will uh, get you in contact with the the person that can answer all of the questions you have. Thank you very much and um, have a nice evening or day, depending on the time <laughs> at which you are. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.